Okay, my phone says it's six o'clock, and so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for coming uh, to the June meeting of the DNA Interest Group. Uh, tonight, uh, what I'm going to focus on is uh, just going through and doing a presentation on um, this uh, re recent feature that was added to the Ancestry DNA platform. And so, how many are how many individuals here are Ancestry DNA testers? Raise your hand. And so quite a few of you have access to that particular feature. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit sort of as a journal club. There was an article that was published um, in Nature Communications uh, by the scientists at Ancestry DNA on really the methods that underlie this feature that was implemented in the platform. Uh, and I'll go through um, and sort of summarize briefly what those methods were, uh, what some of the findings are, and then we'll launch into sort of how that uh, sits within the platform uh, um, and what its potential utilities are to you as a, as a, as a user. And so that's the goal for tonight. Um, it's not working, so I'll do this. So just to let you know, there's a nice um, schedule put together by the library. So we thank the library again for hosting us for this uh, monthly meeting. Uh, what they've done is put together an updated flyer that has uh, the topics through, the, through November. And so we do meet the fourth Tuesday of each month here, 6 to 7 p.m. Um, and uh, the topics through October here are, um, I'll be on RAGBRAI in July, and so I have Drew Kitchen from uh, Department of Anthropology is going to talk about archaic ancestry. I have this series that I want to do for August and September on sort of hidden secrets discovered through DNA. One of these is a case of an individual searching for his biological family. Uh, using 23andMe and Ancestry DNA as that search process. Actually, I actually have a graduate of the University of Iowa uh, who keeps a blog on his search. Uh, he's a writer, editor in Chicago, who's going to come over and tell us about um, uh, his efforts to find his uh, biological grandfather. Um, and then uh, we'll do September on family secrets revealed on finding new relatives. If anybody has particularly compelling stories that they would like to contribute to either of these topics, let me know. Um, and I'm, uh, we, we'll see about uh, incorporating uh, you into these particular um, meetings. And then October, we'll talk about uh, uh, relationships. And so November, and then November is on doggy DNA. That didn't fit on the slide. Uh, so tonight, um, what the objective, objectives are is first to highlight the features of this study. And so the study on 770 research considered Ancestry DNA customers uh, and what they, they did and what they found in that analysis relate those particular methodologies developed in that study to this feature that was, implement, that was implemented in the Ancestry DNA platform. Um, and then uh, discuss the utility of this as a user in terms of uh, exploring your family history. So the first thing I would like to do is talk about uh, this study a little bit in terms of uh, an overview of the methodology and the findings that came out of this particular study, because this sets a framework for uh, what's being done behind the scenes uh, in your, uh, to, to produce this particular report in your Ancestry DNA uh, web platform. And so this is based on a study um, that was published in Nature Communications earlier this year. Um, and um, so this is research consented individuals. And as a customer of Ancestry DNA, you have the option to consent to their research. And so this would be a case of 770 individuals, 770,000 individuals that did consent uh, for the scientists to use their DNA uh, results that were obtained um, after they sent in their samples. And it also allowed those scientists access to their Ancestry.com family trees as well for those that had a family tree linked to that DNA test. And so this is a combined analysis of the DNA samples, and in some cases, the family tree is linked to that. 
I'll go through in some cases from things in the study, some of the supplementary materials that uh, uh, correspond with that article as well, and also uh, some of the things available within the white paper that's available uh, within Ancestry DNA platform uh, on the web. All of this study is really based on the fact that whenever individuals share a recent common ancestor, it's very often that those individuals are going to have regions of identity within their DNA that they have inherited from that common ancestor. So here I'm just illustrating a pair of chromosomes. And so segregation in genetics is every generation, one of those chromosomes is transmitted. So one of those chromosomes of each pair is transmitted to that child. And in this case, it shows starting with that grandfather there with the blue chromosome, sometimes that chromosome can be transmitted in its entirety. Sometimes it may exchange with the other chromosome, and so the gray chromosome there, and in this case we have an exchange product there, so we only have a little bit of that light blue section. Continuing on down those generations, there's a 50-50 chance and also some chance of breaking that up, and so here we've broken up the blue chromosome a bit. Here we've had the 50-50 chance of, uh, and, and we've uh, transmitted that in its entirety. Anytime you have these regions of blue, I'm indicating that in the ancestry DNA data that they collect, that they're able to identify this long segment of identity, and this is an indicator that those individuals share a common ancestor, and that's an expectation whenever you have recent common ancestry that you will, throughout your different chromosomes, have these regions of identity. So identity by descent, and this detection of long segments of DNA identity is a case of that's what Ancestry is using to detect relatives, and based on the amount, they're using that to predict what that relationship is. Our October meeting will deal with this a little, in a little bit more detail um, than I want to tonight. But, you know, this is how you get your DNA relatives match list in Ancestry DNA or in 23andMe. You have your DNA relatives or in Family Finder, you have your DNA relatives. What they're finding are segments of identity between you and someone else in the database. And if you go into that individual match, so that view that match, you can see how much they've identif identified that you and this other individual share. And so 15 DNA segments that are identical in this measure of centimorgans on the amount. And so 366, 366 centimorgans there as the amount of that identical DNA that I share with this predicted second cousin. And then here's a predicted third cousin. We share a little bit less and a predicted fourth cousin, and a predicted uh, distant cousin. And then you'll see in the, each of these cases where I've gone in and found how much Ancestry has identified that I and this other individual share that's identical, we've decreased a little bit. So nine segments, 185 centimorgans, three segments, 43, and down here we have two segments at 19.7. And so that's the inference that myself and these others are relatives and a prediction of what that relationship is. Here I've just sorted some individuals that have McAllister in their family trees. And so this is a case where they have a family tree that their DNA sample is linked to. And by searching on that McAllister surname within that uh, field, I'm able to pull up those individuals among my many, many DNA matches that I have on Ancestry. Okay, so what this study was about is identifying individuals that Ancestry has indicated that they're relatives based on these shared regions of identity. One thing they did was take customers that have reported their birth location and simply look at birth locations of people in Iowa. People in Iowa 
How much identity do they share among each other? People in Iowa, how much identity do they share with people in other states? And they obtain the average amount of identity among the different states within the United States based on reported birth location of those individual 770,000 customers. And this is a case of taking the average amount of identity observed among people within Iowa and then between people from Iowa and every other state using that data and then uh, a statistical analysis to plot that data out. And where is Iowa here? And so, so there we go. So there's Iowa there. And so taking Iowa compared with all other states, using that to project out um, how the states are, um, uh, are, are, are spatially sort of separated in how much identity is present among individuals that were born in those states compared with individuals born in all the other 49 states. And what you can see in this analysis is that there's somewhat of a north-south trend as indicated based on this particular separation on the y-axis is that we tend to have southern states here, northern states up there, and then if you look at this, that's somewhat of an east-west trend where we tend to have states on the east coast tend to have states towards the, uh, the center of the U.S. there on that axis. And basically what they did in this analysis is just say there appears to be some information there in terms of the identity shared by individuals born in Iowa different from the identity that's present between individuals in Illinois versus Pennsylvania. And so taking that, those comparisons to say there is some signal here that they could use to look at individuals based on their birth location and use this I, I shared identity as a signal of what geographic patterns may be revealed in, in that information. Okay. And so this was just sort of a first step on, we have all this data, can we look at it and see any geographic signal? And they're clearly seeing this northwest uh, or north-south signal and this east-west uh, signal in terms of states being a little bit different from each other in terms of uh, the amount of identity shared between individuals born in each of those states. And Louisiana just sort of sits out there by itself. Louisiana sort of sits out there by itself. Yes. What is, what is the axis? This is principal component, so it doesn't matter. It, they don't mean anything. <laughs> but, but it's basically, you could interpret it as north, south, east, west. But this is a way of looking at the data where, in reality, they don't relate to any particular numbers such as latitude and longitude. So that was sort of an initial assessment of the data. What they really did was take those 770,000 individuals, 96% of those were born in the US. And so a large portion of the individuals here are born in the US. They identified those relatives that shared identical regions and their threshold was that measure of centimorgan, so how much is shared. So they set that threshold at 12 centimorgans. And that's about what you would expect to be higher than that uh, between fourth cousins. Um, so fourth cousins and closer, you should, see, you should see on average about 12 centimorgans or more shared between individuals um, at that level. They also, then they, they then use those relatives. So this is a cousin of this individual. They connected them into this network um, and I'll show you a visualization of that in a second, but they connected those individuals in this network of all relatives connected to each other, and they removed out close cousins. And so anybody that had greater than 72 centimorgans, so really close relatives, such as siblings, first cousins, second cousins, and basically third cousins and closer, they removed those connections out. And so basically a network connected at about the third to fourth cousin level um, 
the connections here being that we have a region of shared identity somewhere, regions of shared identity somewhere between 12 and, and 72 centimorgans there. They took that network and identified clusters of individuals within this large network of connections, and then they were able to annotate each of those clusters they identified with geographic information using the prediction that Ancestry gives you in terms of where your ancestors are from in a geographic context. So your ancestors are from Britain or Ireland or, um, or, or uh, uh, Finland. And so taking that prediction of ancestry composition, and they also used family tree data as well for individuals that had a family tree linked to their DNA sample. So this is my summary of the overview of the study. This is their summary from the paper of the overview of the study. And so this connecting the network. So me as an individual, here, here are my connections to other cousins. And so we have that shared identity. They're then doing, just going to overview this, but doing this with clusters within this broader network of connections and then for a given cluster they've identified, they're using the ancestry composition estimates for individuals within that cluster. They're using family tree information linked to that DNA sample for individuals within that cluster to then make inferences about where those, where those individual clusters reside in a geographic context. Because here you can make a prediction of where people are from compared to the different references that Ancestry has in terms of your Ancestry composition. Here you have birth dates, death dates, birthplaces, death places, census records of where people lived, and so you have that type of information uh, that's, that's very rich in terms of um, where people are. So here's just some interesting statistics from the paper. How many of you had a chance to read the paper? I, I did link to it on the G4G website. So Trudy? Scan. Scan. So a few people have read it. So here are a few interesting statistics. This first one I find amazing. So 770,000 people and 99.3% of them are connected into a single network. And so essentially, almost all of them have a connection to someone else in the network. That, to me, is pretty amazing. That's a, that's a big family tree, um, is that you take 770,000 individuals and they all basically have connections. They have this big network. They looked at that network, and we'll talk about subdividing that network into clusters uh, and, and, how, and, and some clusters they identified in a second. But sort of overall, looking at that big network, what they were able to decipher sort of at the, at the highest level were five different um, groupings here. Um, sorry, uh, uh, six different groupings. Five of those contain more than 10,000 individuals. This one's a fairly small individual, uh, sm small cluster, uh, but what they have here are five of them with greater than 10,000 individuals in each of those. They have two of them uh, with about 60% of the, um, of the uh, entire data, and so, um, actually, um, no, almost all the entire data, and that's about 600,000 there in terms of uh, that, in, that data. What's one of the most striking features that you think about, you know, taking this big network, you're dividing in these different clusters, this is US, what, is there anything that strikes anyone in terms of what those clusters are in term, uh, and how, what they identified? Not a lot of Native Americans, so some groups not being represented. Okay, well, Utah is where the Mormons are. They are very big into ancestry. Okay. So, so this one was uh, that Utah was very big into ancestry research, and so that you're seeing Utah being represented there as, as an identification. 
And then uh, we had the point that there's no cluster of Native Americans, and so there are clusters that are missing um, uh, uh, here as you look at these five big um, uh, identified clusters within this network. People don't travel very far to get married. So people don't travel very far. To me, one of the most amazing things is you don't see skin color here. So we think about the US, and we tend to think about skin color as a big separator. And here, looking at these five groups, you don't see any separation of skin color here. And so to me, that's quite dramatic in terms of you, you, know, you, you find this, this very large connectedness. And at this gross level, you don't see that sort of division uh, that we have as a, as a pretty big recognized division uh, in terms of uh, US society. So they then went in and identified, tried to subdivide these clusters into, into more meaningful, smaller subsets. And so here we're taking this network, sort of five big groups, and then trying to make sense of that into, into more meaningful, smaller subsets of that big network. And so um, they went through and used a, a, a couple of different methods to, to take that network and analyze it to find smaller subsets that they then could, once they identified the smaller cluster, use information to annotate that cluster so they can make more sense of who's in that cluster and what they may be able to infer about those individuals. And so I'm not going to talk about the details here, but you know, the idea is to take the big network, digest it down, and find some meaningful groups, annotate those meaningful groups, and identify who is in those groups. And so they did that, and they uh, divided those um, uh, categories of clusters that they identified into a couple of different sort of uh, relevant um, ways of categorizing uh, those individuals. And so this is a case of identifying some clusters that they, uh, that they categorize as these intact immigrant, immigrants. And so these are individuals that essentially they identified the cluster, and here's the size, the number of individuals in each of those clusters. And so here we do see African Americans, and so about 45,000 individuals here um, uh, within this particular cluster. Um, they have the number of birth locations that are annotated there, and so you see that particular clustering there. European Jewish, Irish, French Canadians, Acadians, Scandinavians, Portuguese, Finnish, and Hawaiians. And so these are cases where geographically there's some uh, differences in variation across uh, uh, different geographic regions. And in this case, those individuals are bringing that uh, uh, somewhat differentiation into the United States and maintaining that and they're, be, they're able to recognize that in terms of the clustering. And so I'll just show you um, sort of the annotation level here, focusing on uh, the iris individuals, on, on how they annotate this, both using the ancestry composition. And so once you've identified that cluster of individuals, who's in there? Well, one way you can look at who's in there is taking those individuals and seeing what they're ethnicity estimate is. And so each of those individuals has been compared to reference samples that Ancestry have. They then have a prediction in terms of their uh, geographic proportions, in this case Ireland, Great Britain, and other regions being represented for this individual. That particular set of individuals in that cluster that they annotated as this immigrant cluster from Ireland what you find in that instance is those individuals would be enriched here for their Irish ancestry compared to other ancestries. And so here you're seeing this ability to identify where those individuals are from geographically because those individuals geographically um, 
uh, maintain uh, the uniqueness available within the Irish population or within, uh, uh, within Africans here uh, in terms of estimating African ancestry for those individuals. And so that's one way uh, to annotate it. And in each of those clusters in, in that particular grouping, you're seeing that signature uh, in terms of uh, the unique geographic origins. In addition, if you take birth locations of individuals within the family trees linked to those DNA samples, what you can also see is an enrichment for individuals, and in this case, born in Ireland. And so overall, the database, here are cases where individuals are born in Ireland. And in this case, for those individuals in that cluster that also has enriched Irish ancestry, what you see is an enrichment of individuals within their family trees at the second pedigree generation back, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, um, in this case, born in Munster, Ireland. And so those two levels of, of annotation in terms of ancestry composition and where people are born within the family tree, using that to, um, uh, to, to annotate that particular cluster. In the paper, they focus a little bit on French Canadians and Acadians because they each have somewhat of a shared history in terms of um, their origins in France, their establishment within, uh, within Canada, but unique origins then are unique migra migrations into the United States. And so they do have a unique genetic signature that was able to be identified in terms of clustering French Canadians, clustering Acadians. And in this case, what you're seeing is where those individuals' ancestors were born in each of these clusters. And so French Canadians in pink, Acadians in blue, and where they were, uh, where, where individuals in their pedigrees were born zero to two generations ago. And so in southern Louisiana, and then sort of uh, in New England, and then three to five generations ago, and then six to nine generations ago. And so you're seeing their histories as they go back in time in terms of their pedigrees and the family trees that links to, that links to their DNA samples. So we talked about ancestry composition earlier in this DNA interest group, so I think back in February or so, uh, and we had, actually had some good examples of admixed individuals in terms of having unique ancestries. And so what they were able to identify in this subset of clusters are individuals that there's um, uh, admixture, and so they bring together different geographic regions in their ancestry, but yet then they maintain this unique cluster within the, within the Americas. And so Northeast Mexico, uh, New Mexicans, uh, West Mexico, uh, these are cases where you have uh, inputs from Europe, you have inputs from, uh, from, from uh, Africa, and so there is admixture in terms of uh, the contributions to the establishments of each of these particular clusters, and so there's not a distinct signature in terms of their ancestry composition here, but there is a signature in terms of the birth locations of family members that are present within the pedigrees here. And so there wouldn't be an enrichment for Irish ancestry in these cases. In each of these instances, there's a mixture in terms of geographic ancestry um, of, of the individuals that are present in each of those clusters. But you can still identify them as clustering and see that within their birth locations here. This was the largest group. And so overall, this represents about 60% of, um, of the samples. And so here you have the assimilated immigrant groups. And so again, there's not sort of a unique signature in terms of 
geographic ancestry here. You have geographic ancestry from Great Britain, from Ireland, from Germany. And so you have varied inputs in terms of geographic ancestry. Um, and also in this case, they were sort of the least distinct in, certain, in terms of the clusters and how those clusters are distinct from other clusters. And so in this case, what you have is lower Midwest Appalachians, Northeastern Utah, Upland South, Pennsylvania, Lower South. And one thing that they did in this particular group is look at how those groupings related to geography, and in this case, looking at those groupings related to latitude at wet uh, where individuals were born within the pedigrees of individuals within those clusters. And so, you know, this is the zero generation. So where were those individuals born based on the latitude? What you see in the Northeast and Utah cluster is that they're higher latitude. What you see in the lower south, there's lower latitude within the U.S. in terms of where they were born. And so that's the individuals here tested, but it not applies to as you go back within their family trees as well. And so going back and looking at the average latitude of their parents, of their grandparents, of their great-grandparents, what you see is that difference in terms of where individuals were born continues back um, throughout those uh, family trees. And so here's a case where it's, it, it, it's really sort of continuous variation, but that continuous variation is mostly structured in a north-south gradient um, uh, over, over the United States. And then the last set of clusters that they um, identified are in individuals where their, their, their sort of geographic ancestry um, is similar to those assimilated groups, but there's been uh, isolation after establishing these groups within the United States. And so this is a case of individuals in Utah. And so you'll actually see in the Im images in a second, there's sort of two groups in Utah, one of them more connected to the Northeast. There's this group that's more disconnected from the Northeast, Mennonites, Appalachians, and Amish. Uh, these, are, these are cases where there's been uh, uh, isolation after the migration uh, from Europe establishment of these groups in the US. So that sort of these groups, this is these groups in one image plotted on where those groups are identified. And so this is plotting and giving a size based on the size of the circle, sort of how many birth locations are in those areas. And so one of the things you're seeing in this is that big group of assimilated individuals and that north-south discrimination. And so here you have the northeast, and then there's a good connection with Utah between individuals in Utah back to the northeast, this Pennsylvania uh, uh, cluster, uh, lower Midwest Appalachians. Uh, then we have the upland south, and then you have lower south here in terms of that big uh, set of individuals that represents about 60% of the samples. And then you see some of the other cases. So the Acadians that I um, showed you, the French Canadians, uh, some cases that we did not go through. So the Finnish here, Scandinavians, um, so on and so forth. So this is one representation of some of those groups plotted across the United States. Here's another one, and so here's the African Americans in terms of uh, uh, where their uh, birth locations are deciphered from the family trees, um, uh, and then some other samples as well. And so what you see in Utah, some mention of Utah, there's sort of two different groups, this, this uh, post-migration uh, group uh, versus the group that's more connected back to the Northeast here. Uh, in terms of uh, being in that cluster, being part of that cluster. Any sort of quick questions, comments? Because I do have more. This is, just, this is just a review of the paper. I don't understand the Northeast Utah connection. 
Well, it? Utah, well, it's basically the migration of the Mormons. Uh, and so here you have a strong connection between the Northeast and Utah, but then, then there's this other group that I don't quite understand that's sort of unique from those on other individuals that are more tightly connected back to the Northeast. And so there's sort of two, these two groups within Utah, one of them being more disconnected, one of them being more connected back to the Northeast. Okay. Or time frame at which they migrated, um, probably more likely. Well, the, 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 main, the main establishment um, was then. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the paper said anything about, like, any criteria it used to include or not include pedigree information because you look at the numbers of individuals sampled and the number of like pedigree reports and depending on the group you're talking about, you know, you might have more annotations and so more robust support for that. Right. They essentially said that they're going on the fact that they have tons of information and they hope with that tons of information that the signal basically outweighs any noise. And so in this case, whenever you're looking at that ton of information in terms of birth location, this, is, this would be a better illustration of that. The information in terms of birth location is that you're hoping that there's some signal that sort of overwhelms any of the noise that's in those birth locations. So that's what you're hoping for anyway. Yeah, because I, I remember we talking about the idea too that if somebody's ancestry family tree is wrong then and somebody sees their that tree and then copies all that information it can kind of spread but yeah you're probably right in the sense that there's just so much data that small errors like that probably okay. ma'am 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 can you talk in the microphone I'm confused about how sample size affects the results. I mean, I don't really quite get it. <laughs> well, so sample size. So they have a hard, large number of samples. They're still able to detect small numbers of individuals that, that form a cluster. And so the, the idea of a cluster is that those individuals are very highly connected to each other, but very loosely connected to everyone else in the network. And that, that's the, the, the distinction of that cluster. And you can even have a small set of individuals that are very tightly connected, and then very few connections to the larger network, and that still could be identified as a cluster. And so that's uh, the uh, case for some of these instances where you have small numbers of individuals here. And so, for instance, on this page, what we have are some fairly small clusters, especially compared here, when you look at the numbers of individuals here, that you know, the, the smallest is 7, 77,000 here, whereas in this case, you have cluster, a cluster of the Amish that's 1,000 individuals. So a small set of individuals that are very tightly, lots of identity among those individuals that, that can be identified, but very little compared to the other large number of individuals within the entire network. So would you say it's sort of an introductory study? I mean, in a sense, it doesn't seem very scientific. Well, it is. It's a network analysis. The, beauty, the, the difficulty is actually parsing out what the clusters are. And they go through the supplement, and they go through sort of another level of trying to deconstruct those clusters into smaller and smaller bits. And for this type of data, it's very, very hard to sort of uh, decide when you stop uh, deconstructing things into smaller and smaller groups where we have connections here and disconnections with everyone else. 
again, we have 99.3% of the individuals all being connected within this large network. And so what we're trying to decipher out of that is some small subsets of individuals that are more connected to each other and less connected to everyone else. Okay, and then once we do that, what can we decipher about who those individuals are using their ancestry composition and pedigree information um, uh, that they have associated with their DNA sample? And you know that's that's the product. So this is the this is the scientific study that they could make some sense of this big network of connections. The implementation of this is that they can go in and take their data, make these inferences about these groups of individuals that are more connected to each other, less connected to everyone else in the database, make some inferences about who those individuals are based on their ancestry composition and their, and their family trees. Um, and so they're defining these particular genetic communities using the same types of analytical methods that they use in the study. And then in this case, they're doing that for some individuals. And the way that they ultimately take you as a customer and decide whether or not you're a member of a community. So they're defining communities based on that analysis. So they have this community defined. Basically, they take you and your DNA matches and your DNA matches are really sort of used as a proxy, so an indicator on whether or not, yes, you belong to that community, or no, you do not belong to that community. And so they're defining all of these communities, and then you as a customer, your DNA matches are simply being compared against each one of those communities to determine if you're a member or if you're not a member. And they're also giving you an estimate of how confident they are in that membership. And so yes, no, and the confidence level of that membership uh, within that community. And so if you're an Ancestry DNA customer, you log into your account, what you now see since this came out is you know, in addition to this ethnicity estimate, and I, I like this distinction of this is looking at sort of thousands of years ago on where your ancestors resided. This is a case of sort of estimating hundreds of years ago where your ancestors are, are, are resided within these genetic communities. And so in this case, for this account, there's three genetic communities identified. If you click on this, you'll then see what those three genetic communities are. And then also the confidence, and so in this case, a low level confidence in terms of belonging to that particular genetic community. And so here's the names of those genetic communities. Um, uh, there's an inference on how strong they are in terms of predicting uh, the, the membership within each of those genetic communities. And so this is another way of viewing that is you know, this individual, the ethnicity estimate. So the ethnicity estimate is sort of over here in, in Europe. So thousands of years ago, that's where that, those, that individual's ancestors are from. In the case of genetic communities, that's sort of the spectrum of the US that this individual is a descendant from in terms of the genetic communities post-colonization on where, those, where that individual's ancestors are present within these clusters. And in this case, they're very big clusters in terms of early colonization and lots of members present within each of these clusters. And so let's just look at this example, and I'm going to show you a couple, a couple examples using my mother and her sister to sort of illustrate a few points. So, ethnicity estimate, and then we have our genetic communities. So she's a member of two different, my mother's a member of two different genetic communities. And this is a case where she's very likely connected to this early settlers of the lower Midwest in Virginia, and then possible connection to early settlers uh, of northern Arkansas and middle Tennessee. So the red dots, 
the uh, Tanish Dots or the settlers of the lower Midwest in Virginia. One thing to consider is that these groups are very well connected, and so in reality, sort of these dots there in yellow are a subset of this larger group, and so if you look sort of at that early settlers of, of the lower Midwest in Virginia, this is a very large group. What you're actually seeing in this image here is a smaller subsection that she's also a member of, but a little bit less uh, uh, connected to a smaller subset of this. Um, so this is a hierarchy, so a higher hierarchy or a smaller hierarchy is this case of settlers of the Missouri Ozark and East Tennessee. And so in this case, if you toggle here, what you can see is that distribution of dots in terms of where individual individuals are, are inferred to reside in the US, and then you can toggle to this one, which is this smaller subset of individuals. She's a little bit less likely to be a member here. She's more likely to be a member of that smaller, uh, of that larger um, set of individuals within this hierarchy. And so this is that case of looking at the larger grouping. She's very likely to be a member of that larger grouping on that scale. And then if you toggle then to this smaller subset in the Missouri Ozarks in East Tennessee, she's a little bit less likely, so she's in that likely category there. But these are cases where this is a smaller subset of this larger um, uh, cluster of individuals, um, and they're showing each inference in, in each of these cases. And so you can even see that. So you and 608 of your DNA matches in this case, you and 1,200 of your DNA matches there um, in terms of members of that cluster. Okay, this is a case where you and your matches are being used to identify membership within a cluster. And so siblings are not necessarily going to have the same clusters. So here's my mother again. Here's her membership in those clusters. Here's her sister. Same parents, and what you see, sort of similar coloring, but their names of the clusters are different. And so here's that smaller subset. So the, uh, my mom's sister is, is, is coming up highest there. You can actually toggle between the larger group here, but this is what's being reported at this level for my mom's sister. And then she even has a subset of that red group that my mom had here the settlers of Tennessee and Upper Cumberland. And so you're seeing that smaller grouping there in terms of that red group here, those individuals there. So this is a case where, you know, they've done the analysis, they've identified all of these different clusters. You can go in and actually navigate those clusters. And so you can see which ones are available now through the analyses. And you, you as a customer will either be put into one or more clusters or not uh, based on your matches and their presence within, within each of these uh, genetic communities. So what's the utility? It's interesting. One thing that you could potentially use it as is a way of sorting your particular matches. And so, you know, the story side was sort of what I was showing previously in terms of where individuals were born. If you click on this connection uh, tab here, what you see under the connection tab is a case where you can just click here and view all your matches. And so this is a case of sorting out your DNA matches. You can also do it within the DNA uh, matches uh, uh, listing where you can simply select on a genetic community and search your matches that are all members of that particular community. And so if you're looking for your matches that are in, you know, your, 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 your Norway community, you could sort your matches and identify individuals there. You also see an enrichment of surnames here that are present within those communities. I, I haven't seen where any of the surnames within my families for those groups 
actually um, are very useful. And so, but there's a list of surnames there. I did check to see if John Logston was a match of our family, but um, he apparently is not, uh, even though Logston is a name there that's enriched within this particular community. Um, so that's one way that it can be useful in terms of sorting those particular matches, uh, identifying your DNA matches that are also members of that community, um, and, 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 and sorting them out. And so you can do that for any of your particular communities, going in and selecting uh, that grouping, and, um, and that will then give you a list there. Another thing that I consider as a useful, uh, useful application of this is that my mother is sort of the, um, uh, the model for an ancestry DNA tester. And so um, she has 1,600 fourth cousins and closer. Uh, she has a good family tree. And so you know, automated connection between her family tree and other people's family tree. There's 416 green leaves that come up with my mother. Um, she has 53 DNA circles. Um, and so another automated way of going in and connecting people based on their, their history. And so she's a poster child of, um, of uh, what an ideal ancestry DNA customer is in terms of the utility. She only has two genetic communities. So my father-in-law is not a poster child for, as a good ancestry DNA customer. He's a descendant of recent German migrants. And so German migrants throughout the mid to late 1800s. And so he has 64 fourth cousins and closer. So very few close connections within uh, the Ancestry DNA platform. Uh, we have a pretty good family tree for him. And there's two shared ancestor hints. One of those is with his grandson. And so it really doesn't count. Um, uh, but we've identified a couple of others within the tree. No DNA circles there. Uh, for him, but he has two genetic communities. And so this is a case where individuals that are not necessarily poster children for making family connections on ancestry DNA uh, can gain some insight in terms of the genetic communities. Because small clusters of individuals, actually there's more power in identifying those connections among small subsets of individuals that are tightly connected to each other, loosely connected to everyone else in the network. Um, and you know, he has a cluster that goes back to Germany. He has a cluster, or he was a member of the cluster of the Germans in the Midwest, even though most of his uh, German ancestors migrated to Texas. Um, uh, but he's still connected with that uh, uh, German history of, of colonizing the Midwest. Um, and so this is a case that I think is sort of a, a balance in terms of recent migrants versus my mother, whose basically ancestors walked off the Mayflower and every other ship after that. Um, uh, she has no recent <laughs> migration in her history, um, uh, and therefore she has lots of, lots of cousins out there um, that are in the Ancestry DNA database. And so to me, this is a, a different feature uh, that has some utility uh, to, to uh, very broadly uh, to lots of different Ancestry DNA customers. So resources for you know, exploring this is there is the article. The supplement is very rich and sort of digging in a little bit deeper um, uh, in terms of the science and where the science is limited in terms of how well can you discriminate clusters and how finely can you dissect that network. Uh, the white paper um, uh, is also rich with information in terms of how the technology is done. And then if you're on your Ancestry account, you hit, click on this little question mark, so that little button there, uh, what you then get to is a set of answers to questions um, about the genetic community's feature. And so some of those that I've addressed here, and so what are those genetic communities? How do you get assigned to them? Why do family members look different in terms of their genetic communities? Um, a variety of different things uh, that you might have questions about. So that help um, menu here uh, is a case of getting some of that information. 
you guys, what are your own experiences on your genetic communities? Any insights that you have in terms of what you've discovered yourselves? Still waiting for the results. Still waiting for the results. Wait, wait, wait. I'll just mention, obviously, my known direct heritage is only Norwegian. And it separated me into two groups, two areas, two groups in Western Norway and two in Eastern Norway. My mother's relatives are all from Eastern Norway, and my dad's are all from Western Norway. And so it was able it to was, just... It was exactly what I would have thought, given where I know people are from. Uh -huh. So it may, it may be even a case that... Your family, so are you a research consented individual? No. You're not, and so you actually, your, your data was not to used to, to build those no. um, if you're not research consented. So. I, I don't hear completely well, so can you hear, can anybody hear? Um, it is, it's on for the television audience. Oh. It's on. It's um, on. My sister belongs to five different different groups. She's possibly in five different groups. Her three siblings each belong to one of those different groups. So each, we just get a little different piece of, and we see it when we're looking at ancestors. Joy has got my mother's father's line, and my brother's got this, you know, we, we just, you, know, you can see who you're related to. Right. When you get down to third and fourth cousins, you're not gonna all Match. So there's quite a bit of discrimination sort of at that level at which you're looking at those connections. Right. And they are using, you know, your DNA relatives as a way of identifying yes or no, you belong to each one of those clusters, and siblings are going to be quite distinct in terms of their third, fourth, and higher uh, relatives uh, that they have. Uh, because siblings only share 50% identical DNA and they have 50% unique DNA um, uh, that they uh, have represented their parents. So. Other examples or questions about the feature? I mean, one of the things you can look at whenever on the storyline is individuals within your family tree and that they've identified as part of that sort of uh, history and where their birth locations are. And I didn't sort of go into that depth of navigating through the story, but you can see in that story individuals within your family history and how they may reflect uh, that particular community uh, for individuals that are born, say in my case, some in the South or within uh, Virginia, Tennessee, uh, through Missouri, so um, you, you can you can look at those features as well. So they appear to have used some Canadian information for the Acadian um, analysis. Do they? Do you know if they intend to use like Ontario, where there was current day Ontario, where there was a lot of immigration? Well, my understanding is that they're going to continue to update the community identification. And so that's one aspect of it, is identifying the communities. And uh, the idea would be that as they accumulate more individuals that they are research consented, they can build more communities. And then, in this case, as Canadians enter in that database, they could, they could use that to, to inform those communities. And that's going to be a richer part of the data. Um, uh, it, it's not supposed to be static in terms of the communities they identified, those are the only ones that they're ever going to identify. That's going to continue to evolve, and you'll always be evaluated against each particular community on whether or not you uh, appear to be a member or not. And are the results updated in real time like the rest of Ancestry? So you can yep. sign on the next day, and it's going yep. to be slightly yep. different. Continually updated. Yep. Is it kind to go into Europe, like for your father and all? Do they test it all outside of the U.S.? Yeah, so Ancestry Service is available in the U.K., um, Australia, various other countries, not worldwide. And so I don't think it's available in Germany. Um, my understanding is no, but I'm, I'm not an expert on that. So. 
She wants you to use the microphone, so. It doesn't make you louder. It just helps us. For OK. Um, so do the, does Ancestry get access to the Iceland database? No. Because there's this story that around 1850, a small population from Iceland was convinced to convert to Mormonism and migrated to, to Utah. So, so it'd be hard for them to trace it back, right? Well, potentially that might be that subset of individuals in Utah, if that's the case. Right. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that story, but that, that may be a reason for that particular subdivision of individuals in Utah. So it's uh, 7 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and adjourn. If there are any particular questions people have, discussion people want to have, um, we'll feel free to stay afterwards. Be here for July. Drew Kitchen will talk about the archaic ancestry features and estimates uh, and sort of how that's done. Uh, so thanks for coming.